It was pretty intense. Brainstorming features, shortlisting them, and finding the components for our wireless sensor network. But now it's time to shower some magic of engineering to convert those shortlisted features and individual components into a usable circuit. I'll be using KiCad and Git to design and manage the complete life cycle of this project. If you're new to this, I'll put a link in the description where you can learn both. However, at the same time, please feel free to use whatever is comfortable for you. Both our slave and master have similar core components. So let's start with the base circuit that is common for both. And maybe later replicate these for the slaves and master individually. For now, I'll create a KiCad project and open the schematic editor. According to the previous video, the core part of the circuit consists of three major components. The ESP32C3 Mini, the RFM96 LoRa module and the MAX485 RS485 to UART converter. So let's start by placing them on the sheet. Hmm, it seems like ESP32C3 isn't currently available in KiCad's default library. What about the RFM96? Okay, that's available. And what about MAX485? Good, that's available too. I usually start with the microcontroller and build the rest of the circuit around it. And luckily, I did not have to create a custom symbol for this. I found both the symbol and the footprint for this microcontroller within DigiKey while I was doing my research. So it was pretty easy to download and install. Once I have imported the library and placed the symbol, we need to find a minimal circuit that can make our MCU work. And the best place to check for this would be the data sheet. For the ESP32C3 Mini, if you scroll through the data sheet, we can find the peripheral schematic, which explains the usage of ESP32C3 in a circuit along with some of its features. But for our minimal setup, we won't be needing this external crystal oscillator, JTAG, and the USB. So we can remove all this connection and focus on the pin 8, 9, and 2, because these are the bootstrapping pins. Then focus on the EN pin, which has to be pulled low to power the IC. And finally, the TX and RX pin to program the IC over UART. If you're wondering where I found all these details about the EN, about the bootstrapping pins, you can just crawl up a bit and search for the pin description or pin configuration in the data sheet. Here, you'll find explanation for each of the pins and how to handle them. And you can apply the same method to any microcontroller or any integrated circuit to find their application schematic. Anyway, now based on what I found in the data sheet, I'll quickly replicate that in KiCad. Starting with the EN, bootstrapping and finally adding some header pins for TX and RX along with some GPIO pins. You can see how easy it was to build a minimal setup for an MCU just by looking at the data sheet, which is pretty neat. Now moving further, we'll follow the same process for the LoRa module as well. So I pulled up the LoRa data sheet and tried to find the application diagram or something similar that explains the connection of the module with a microcontroller. And this is the circuit, and it's not very clear. But if you notice, most of the circuit is just the setup for the microcontroller, and only the tiny portion is for the LoRa, just with the SPI connection and a capacitor at the power. That makes our work a lot easier, as we can connect this SPI pins to any pins on the ESP32C3, because it supports something called GPIO matrix, which lets us map any peripheral to any GPIO. But just to reduce some headaches down the road, always stay away from this bootstrapping pins, even though they can be used as GPIO and special function pins. Now for the final component, the MAX485, I did not go through the data sheet, but apart from the data sheet, I found two products that's already on the market, which makes it more reliable since it's already been tested and is in production. Here are the two circuits for the products. The first one is pretty simple. It just adds a terminating resistor of 120 ohms, some pull-up resistors and some pull-down resistors. And finally, a 10 UF and a 0.1 UF capacitor at the power. I would love to explain the reason for these resistors, but it's beyond the scope of this video. So I'll give a link in the description that talks more in detail about the RS485 protocol. Anyway, this first circuit did not work well for me in the past when I used the Modbus protocol. I faced some of the other trouble using this. So I chose the next circuit where they use some inverter NOT gates, which handles the data direction on the RS485 bus along with some TVS diodes and a fuse to keep the RS485 bus stable. Overall, this particular circuit worked for me in all situations without any issues. I'm guessing it's because of the TVS diode, which prevents transient voltage and makes the communication very stable. So I'm going to add the first circuit along with the TVS diodes. With that, we have completed our core connections. 
Now let me prettify this circuit and quickly save and commit this project. Once that's done, I'll copy the schematic and create a new keycap project for our master node and paste your schematic in the new master schematic editor. The one thing that I want to add to the master node along with the core feature is the power management. In the master node, I need two power systems. One to power the external circuit with 5 volt and 2 amp and one to power the rest of the circuit with core components on board. But even before that, we need to stabilize and protect the input that will go into the circuit. By doing this, we'll make sure our power system is very stable, robust and reliable. So we are going to focus on three key things. Overcurrent protection, transient voltage protection, finally a reverse voltage protection. So first let's start with a power port where we can receive the input. In this case, I'm using a DC jack. Then let's start by adding a fuse, which will break the circuit if my circuit starts to consume more than 2 amps. Since it's a polyfuse, once we disconnect the power and fix the faulty component or the short circuit, the fuse will automatically repair or say heal itself to its normal operation, unlike a regular fuse where you have to manually change it. Now we can look into the transient voltage protection. Usually when you turn on any system, the voltage doesn't reach its set value instantly. It takes some time to slowly rise to the set value. And this can sometimes affect the SMPS circuit or other circuit that are voltage sensitive. To solve this, we can use a TVS diode which will prevent this and allow the voltage only when it's stable. Finally, for the reverse voltage protection, I'll be using a short key diode. This allows current to flow only through one direction. So when the polarity is changed, the circuit will be cut off. There are two reasons why I chose a short key diode instead of choosing a generic one. One, it has a very low resistance in nature, so there will be very little power loss. Secondly, it has a very fast recovery time. But you might think, why use reverse voltage protection if you are using a barrel jack? Isn't it a standard connector? That's because the male connector comes in two ways. One is a center positive and the other one is a center negative, where the polarities are reversed on the pins. So just to be doubly cautious, we'll be using the reverse voltage protection. After implementing this in our setup, we have a pretty stable and protected input. Now with this input, we can start creating our two power management systems. Let's start with the external supply of 5V and 2A. For this, I chose LM2596S-5. One of the main reasons for using this particular IC is that it's very commonly available and it's super low cost. And also you would have noticed this being used in most of the DIY projects. Here for the circuit, I'll follow the same process as before and check the data sheet and draw the circuit. Next, to power our core circuit, we need a 3.3 volts and for this, I chose the AMS1117. Even though this has a little power loss compared to other parts in the market, I chose this because it's inexpensive and outputs a higher current. And also, it's a very simple circuit with just few input and output filtering capacitors. And now finally, to finish the schematic, I'll just include a WS2812B RGB LED to finish our master node. Now, don't forget to save and commit the changes. Now for the slave node, let me start a new keycap project and get the base schematic into the schematic editor. Now for the slave node, we'll have four stages of power management, unlike the master node. We'll be handling the power from the DC input, handle the power from the battery, and then handle the power to the core circuit, and finally handle the power to the sensor. Usually a circuit with this many features will be pretty complicated or expensive to implement. But I saw this neat technique used by Adafruit where they use the BQ2407IC and its capability to use it as a multi-purpose charger with options to charge through DC jack, USB-C and solar. And also it can directly power the circuit from any of this input while charging the battery simultaneously, which makes this circuit very efficient for battery operation. In this case, I went through the data sheet and you can see on the front page, we have the application diagram, which is the minimal setup that we need to run this particular IC. It looks very simple. All you need is two LEDs to indicate power good and charging and then some battery connection and then some resistor to limit the charging current. To understand better, I also referred back and forth between the Adafruit circuit. Since the circuit is little complicated, I think it's a best time to show you how to use the hierarchical sheet. Just click on this tool or use the shortcut S and then draw a small rectangle which will hold our schematic. For the name, I'll just call this battery management circuit. Now, once the hierarchical sheet is created, just double click on it, which will open up a brand new sheet where we can draw the battery management circuit. 
Now to go back to the main sheet, there are two methods. You can either use the navigator over here and then click on the root page option. And to go back to the battery management circuit, you can either click on this or you can just click on battery management circuit on the navigator. If you don't like to use the navigator over here, you can close the navigator and then use the arrows on the top, which will take you back to the previous sheet that you are working on. Even though you can navigate between these sheets, they both are not interlinked yet. For example, we can't refer this battery label outside this sheet. To solve this, there are two ways. You can either use a global schematic which can be used throughout any schematic or you can use the second method that is hierarchical label which is very similar to your regular label. Just create them and let's give it a name and just click on OK. And here you can see the difference between the hierarchical label and the regular label. Whereas this label helps us connect one sheet to another sheet. Let's see how to do that. And also let me complete the circuit wherever the output is necessary. Once that is done, I'll save the schematic and go back to the root sheet and then use the import hierarchical sheet pins and then click on the battery management circuit. And here we can see the output label has been imported. You can select any location and just do a left click. And here we can connect a different pin or a label which will make the connection on the other sheet as well. Now with this BQ2407IC, we are done with two types of power management handling the DC power input and handling the power from the battery. Now to power the core circuit, we need to use a linear regulator, just like the master node. But I'm not going to use the AMS1117 because of its huge voltage and power loss, which will affect the battery use case of this slave module. That is why I'm choosing MIC5219. This will power the entire core circuit and also it can handle up to 500 milliamp of current, which is more than required to run the core circuit. Since we are planning to use industrial sensors, the voltage range on most of the sensors on the market is around 12 to 24 volts or sometimes even more. So that is why we need to include a boost converter to either step up the input voltage or the battery voltage to the required level. This is the reason I'm going to use MT3608. It's a similar reason why I chose LM2596. I've used it in the past, it's inexpensive and easy to procure. So just like before, I checked the data sheet and found a minimal circuit that can be integrated with our slave node. And I'll do that within the hierarchical sheet. And at the same time, I'll also make sure I get all the important pins into the root sheet. We can finally connect the power ports for these pins. Here it's not necessary to have this protection system as they'll introduce power loss and decrease the life of your battery. But I did have some options to disconnect them when they are not in use. So it's a choice whether you need to include them in the circuit or not. Now finally to complete the circuit, just like the master node, I'll include a WS2812B RGB LED to complete the circuit. So this completes our slave circuit as well. Let me quickly save this project and commit it to Git. Here's a very important note. It might seem like I'm just checking the data sheet for the circuit and building the schematic for the project. Well, that's partially true. But there is a lot of electronics involved in selection of circuits and value of the components, which sometimes requires a very thorough read of the data sheet or basic working of the features that you are trying to implement. For example, if you have noticed the SMPS circuit, I am not exactly using the values from the data sheet. I had to consider the working frequency and find the inductor and capacitor values based on the input range. But to keep the video a little simpler, I had to simplify some of them. So make sure to do proper research before jumping into making a complex circuit. In the next video, we'll see how we can find the footprints for each of these components and figure out the PCB layout for our PCB. If you have any questions or doubts so far, you can always comment them in the PCB Cupid Q&A section. So until the next time, keep learning and keep creating.